Tips on running mystery games, today on Dungeon Craft. Welcome to Dungeon Craft. I'm Professor Dungeon Master. Today we're going to talk about how to run mystery games. I'm going to give you a couple of tips I've picked up over the years. Running mysteries can be very intimidating. If a dungeon hallway splits off in the east and west corridors, the characters have to go one way or the other they know which way to go. The problem with the mystery is a lot of times they don't know which way to go and so that can be intimidating for the dungeon master, that idea that they can go anywhere. But there are ways that you can keep them on track which I'm going to share with you. This video focuses, I don't know if it's so much design as it is execution. So even if you're working out of a, a pre-written module and you're trying to prepare it, these tips should help you out. One thing you need to understand is the limitations of your genre. RPGs are not movies, they're not television, and your player characters, your players are not going to perform like Sherlock Holmes. They need way more clues and they're not going to figure out the mystery so easily. The other thing you need to know is that Pathfinder and D&D are not built for mystery adventures. The types of spells that were created for D&D, they're meant for marching through a dungeon. If you're going to run a mystery adventure, it's better if you have a very low fantasy, low magic world with very little access to things like spells like Detect Evil which we're going to talk about the spells, but those spells can really screw you up. So I, I'm going to have some tips for dealing with certain spells, but be aware that that is the kind of thing that's just going to make it more difficult. So here are my five pieces of advice. Number one is apply Chekhov's gun. Anton Chekhov was one of the world's foremost dramatists and short story writers. He was very innovative, and Chekhov's gun is the idea that if you have a loaded gun on stage in Act 1 of your play, by Act 2, someone's got to fire it. In other words, if something is important, it's on stage. And if it's not important, it shouldn't be on stage at all. Similarly, when you run an adventure and you're describing a room, only describe things that are critical to the plot. So, listening to me speak for a long time is boring, so let's take a look at my minis. Let's apply Chekhov's gun to this crime scene. There's a corpse in the center, which is the first thing that the characters are going to notice. Then from left to right, we see an owl sculpture on a pedestal. We also have a fireplace, a portrait, and a writing desk with books on it. Chekhov's gun requires that if there's an owl sculpture, there is something hidden in that owl. Perhaps it's a tiny key, which doesn't fit the lock of the room, so the players know it's a clue to get into something else. Now, if the owl does not contain a clue, it should not be in the room. The same thing with the fireplace. That fireplace is going to contain a burned piece of paper, and that piece of paper is a clue. If the fireplace doesn't contain a burned piece of paper or a loose brick that hides a secret compartment, the fireplace shouldn't be here. This portrait is going to be of an ancestor who is critical to the murder plot. Otherwise, if it's just a portrait, then there's something behind the portrait. For example, a wall safe with a combination lock that no thief can open. The books on the desk need to contain a clue. Perhaps they contain a list of suspects, it's a diary entry, or it might be missing a page that was torn out by the murderer. The desk may have a hidden compartment. That compartment perhaps is opened by the key that's in the owl. It also might contain the combination to the safe that's behind the portrait. Chekhov's gun demands that nothing exists for the sake of existing. If something exists in your role-playing game, it needs to have a purpose. If it doesn't have a purpose, it shouldn't exist at all. So you got to be careful when you're giving descriptions not to get too colorful and include extraneous details that the players are going to focus on. This happens in even professionally published work. This is The Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh. I think it's the first D&D module to contain sort of mystery elements in it. And so this is professionally written, but let's take a look at what's on page three. So the mystery centers around this haunted house. Let's look at room six, living area three. This room is empty. The only matter of interest is the quantity of fallen plaster on the floor is significantly greater than elsewhere. Below it, the floors in the two rooms above 14 and 15 are considerably weaker than elsewhere. There is nothing else of interest and nothing of value here. And that's why this plaster should not be there. I know exactly what my players are going to do with this plaster. First, they're going to probe it with a 10-foot pole. Then they're going to flick money at it. They'll be throwing copper pieces at it, trying to hit the plaster. Then they're going to detect evil on the plaster. Then they're going to take plaster samples and send it to the lab. They'll ask, does the magic user, can they make a history roll and learn about, do they have any insight into the history of the plaster? They'll ask, was the plaster made from local clay or is it imported plaster? They'll probably go back to town and round up every craftsman that works with plaster and interrogate them. That's what's going to happen, and that's why the plaster shouldn't be there. This is probably foreshadowing, like if you go in room 14 and 15, you could possibly fall through the floor. But this 
sagging plaster ceiling ought to be in a separate room that already has some other clue in it because empty rooms in a mystery adventure should just should not exist. Empty, uninteresting rooms exist in real life, but not in games, books, and movies. Also, handouts will help. There's a letter or a diagram or something in that desk. I suggest getting parchment paper and writing out your letters and diagrams and clues, if they're important clues. Write them out and hand them to the player characters. That way it indicates, look, this is an important clue. Advice number two concerns NPCs. I regard NPCs as furniture, and just like the actual furniture in the room, if a non-player character is not important, they shouldn't be in your adventure. One way to distinguish the important non-player characters from the non-important player characters is to give them name and to speak through the first person. Whereas, if it's a not important player character, just do it through the third person. So, if you just want the inn to be a place for the players to crash, they walk inside, the innkeeper says, yes, we have a room, it's one gold piece a night, and that includes dinner. But if that innkeeper is going to be a, a, an important NPC in the adventure, in the mystery, then that's when you talk in the innkeeper's voice and say, Hello, weary travelers. I am Gustav Gobblegut, proprietor of the Greased Goat Tavern. That's a subtle hint to the players that this guy is important and they should talk to him. I have a buddy who's a real detective, and real detectives spend a lot of their time talking to people that don't know anything. TV detectives, everyone they speak to knows something. Even if it's a red herring, even if it's a person that didn't commit the crime, they have some sort of clue that leads the detectives on the right place. They never just interrogate someone and they know nothing. Again, handouts depicting those characters can be very useful. So if the prime suspects include the butler, the victim's too young second wife, his estranged son, the surly coach driver, and the family physician, go to Google, find some images that look like those people, print them out on cardstock, and hand them to the players. This is a simple way of communicating to them that these are the prime non-player characters that they want to be conversing with to the exclusion of everyone else. Three, and this is such an important piece of advice, don't have the player characters roll to find clues. Just have them find them. Stop it with the search rolls, investigation checks, perception checks. Just have them find the clues. Sherlock Holmes never goes into a room and just misses a clue. The antiquarians in an H.P. Lovecraft story don't go to the library to research the, the blasphemous unnamed entities and find nothing and spend hours waste their time, go home and feed their cat, and maybe I'll go back to the library tomorrow. Like, that doesn't happen. They find the critical information. This is a technique you should take from books and movies. If there is a clue to be found, the player characters automatically find it. If you have Call of Cthulhu, if you want to make a role, say library use, you can make the role, but it, and, it, and if they fail the role, it takes them, say, two days to find that information, but they will 100% find the information. It's not that difficult to find something in a library, it just takes time. There are people to help you, librarians. I once had to look up the survey of my house, and I had to go to the town halls, and there are these old record books with these huge books with all the surveys and the previous owners of the house. It's not that hard to find, and there are people there who help you find it. You, maybe if you missed the role, the book was misplaced, but if, if your person is an academic, they have a 100% chance of finding the clue. Same thing if you have a, a choke point clue, like the players have to find a secret door, they just find it. You might want them to be more specific than to say, well, I searched the room. You know, they have to specify, I am searching the fireplace. And it's just a given. If they're searching the fireplace, that means they're testing all the bricks, they're sifting through the ashes, and you don't have to describe that boring stuff. If your players are investigating, you know, some of the ancient tomb of the yuan Ti and they find strange hieroglyphics, don't make the magic user roll to see if he understands them. He just understands them. Number four is called the Three Clue Rule, and we take this from the Alexandrian blog. And it is a very simple idea. You have to have three clues to lead the players to wherever they want to go. Let's go back to that dead body in the room for a second. Let's say you want to introduce a new suspect, the victim's mistress. So your first clue is the lipstick stain on the victim's collar, which does not match the shade of lipstick that his wife usually wears. Clue two is found in the secret compartment in the desk. It contains a love letter from the mistress to the victim. The third clue is the key in the victim's pocket, which leads to a nearby sleazy hotel room in which the players find an unmade double bed, an empty bottle of expensive champagne, and two empty champagne glasses, on one of which is the same lipstick that, you guessed it, is on the victim's collar. 
These three clues work together to reinforce the idea that the victim had a mistress and she's a possible suspect. So you as a dungeon master, you know the answer, so you might think three clues is too easy, but it's probably not. When the players find that lipstick stain on the collar, they may misinterpret it and say, oh, well, it's his wife's lipstick. That's why you have to have three clues. Trust me, that's a big one. And finally, you got to address the spell situation. You got to know what spells your player characters have. Obviously, the higher levels and the more divination they could get, the more difficult it makes it. Speak with Dead, uh, actually, of all the spells, this is actually the, the easiest to deal with. Maybe the, the victim was attacked from behind. Maybe the killer wore a mask. Maybe the victim was blind. Maybe the killer anticipated the players would know how to speak to the dead, so they cut out the victim's tongue. So there's a lot of different ways to deal with Speak With Dead. Another spell that's really tough, read minds. I mean, if you could read everyone's mind, you would know who the killer is. I would assume that, you know, that, that allows you to read the, like, the top level of thought of people's minds, but, you know, most people, if they murdered someone, that probably, they'd probably be thinking of that. However, there's ways to go around this too. Like, every one of the suspects had a motive for killing the victim. They might have be nervous because they might be nervous because they feel that they're, the crime's going to be pinned on them. Maybe the wife is glad her husband's dead, but that's not because she murdered him. She's happy because her husband was really cheap and abusive and it was a miserable marriage, so she's just glad he's dead. Maybe a character is nervous because they have something else to hide and the player characters misinterpret that as being nervous about the murder. Maybe every single one of the suspects is evil. They just weren't the killer. Maybe the killer hypnotizes himself to forget he ever did the murder. In any event, those divination spells can be really difficult, and that's one of the reasons, I'll be honest, I just take them out of the game. Yeah, things like read mind and mind control and stuff like that, I just don't allow those spells. And it's for this reason I do like mystery adventures, and I don't want to box myself into a place where I, I can't run them. If you're running a low-level game or a retro clone like Lamentations of the Flame Princess, which is really low magic, or your... Uh, some other game systems, obviously Call of Cthulhu or Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Those games really lend themselves to mysteries better because you don't have the ability to read people's minds, which is a real pain in the butt. Before I forget, there's a couple of great supplements if you want to run a great RPG mystery. The first is absolutely free. It's called Noblesse Oblige. It's an adventure for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, but it's easily adaptable for Dungeons & Dragons and you can find it at windsofchaos.com. That's Noblesse Oblige, it's by Charles Morrison. Absolutely stunning layout and artwork, and it is the textbook example of how to write a locked room, Agatha Christie-style fantasy murder mystery. If you're into Warhammer Fantasy role-playing, this is one of the best adventures for Warhammer ever, and it wasn't even written by like in-house staff people. It was written by a fan. And I always thought that one of the problems with Warhammer is they didn't produce enough new material. And I don't know why, when you have guys like this Charles Morrison around, Warhammer is going through another print now. Hire Charles Morrison and have him write adventures for you. The other great scenario is going to cost you a little bit. It's called The Statue of the Sorcerer. And it was made by Games Workshop for Call of Cthulhu with an open license deal in like the late 80s. I think Statue of the Sorcerer is the best one-shot Call of Cthulhu adventure ever. It's fascinating because it doesn't require any combat rolls. All the players do is make research rolls, and, and it doesn't even need many of that. It's an adventure without any combat at all, and yet it will scare the hell out of your players. On Amazon, I saw it for like $75 because it's like collectible now, but on eBay, I saw it for $29.99 for $30. This adventure is worth it. It'll probably take a couple sessions for your players to solve it, but I mean, it is. It sticks out in my memory as one of the best mystery adventures ever written. Totally atmospheric. The handouts are great. It's, it's very clear where the player characters have to go, and it's absolutely terrifying without requiring a single die roll. And that's hopefully that's the reason you come here is because, like, obscure stuff like that that not everybody knows about. So... Check those out. Those are really great scenarios, and they are the textbook on how you should design a mystery.
So those are some of my ideas on how to run a mystery adventure. I just want to take a moment to tell you what's coming up on Dungeon Craft over the next couple of weeks. We're going to upload a lot of cool content. People have asked me how I design adventures, how I think and plot out my campaign. So I'm going to be doing a monthly campaign update starting in September. It's going to come up on the first week of every single month. If you like the sets in this video, we didn't build them for this video. Right now we're shooting a version of Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart. We're adapting it using 28 millimeter miniature so that's really cool that's going to be uploaded probably by the middle of October so look forward to that we recently passed the 1000 subscriber mark which in YouTube land isn't really that big but for us it is absolutely huge and we are so eternally grateful to everyone who subscribes if you haven't subscribed now's a great time just click that bell icon so you'll be informed as soon as new dungeon craft videos are uploaded. If you found this video helpful, click like, put your comments and questions below. We'll try to answer them as soon as we can. Join the conversation. If you've got ideas on how to run mystery adventures, I'd love to hear them. And wow, I almost forgot. Please share this video with your friends on social media so that we can continue to grow the channel. This was Professor Dungeon Master for Dungeon Craft. Thanks for watching. I'll see you at the table and may all your roles be 20s.